No matter who you are or where you are, God has more for you than you ever imagined. All over the world, Kenneth Copeland is sharing the life-changing principles of God's Word. Through this worldwide ministry, believers everywhere are experiencing more health, more prosperity, and more joy than ever before. Watch today and you'll never be the same again. experience that never ends. Interesting, don't you think? I've been wanting to go to a Kenneth Copeland meeting for a long time, but well, it's your decision, dear. Oh, I don't Whatever know. you say, dear. Well, by golly, this time we just won't miss it. The Kenneth Copeland Victory Campaign. It's learning and growing. It's unforgettable moments of sharing and giving and praising the Lord. It's a unique event that's coming again soon to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the Philadelphia Civic Center, December 4th, 5th, and 6th. Meetings start at 7 p.m. Thursday and at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. Friday and Saturday. It's valuable time spent together. The Kenneth Copeland Victory Campaign. Don't forget to be there. meeting last week. Yes, yes wasn't Kenneth fantastic? I thought that was the most powerful spirit-filled preaching I'd ever heard. Oh, we heard you? things that changed our lives, no doubt about music it. music was the best part. I, I think, think those meetings are an experience that never ends. And now, with today's message on our covenant, here's Kenneth Copeland. Let's open our Bibles once again to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, and we'll read there where we read yesterday in both services. Yesterday morning, we began talking about the compacting of the body of Christ. After ministering last night on the Hasid relationship, the agape Hasid relationship that we have with God brought about in our thinking, in our minds, and framed and anchored in our minds by our covenant relationship with Him. Then we begin to see some things in the Apostle Paul's writings that seem hard for us to understand, but we come from Gentile backgrounds that have caused us to not have much understanding of a covenant relationship. The Jewish people came from a Jewish background, and they, they were taught covenant, but they had gotten so religious about the thing, they lost the real impact of it. And it got to where it, it was just a religious thing, and it didn't carry the, the impact. So we're, we're back in a place now where the Holy Spirit is reviving our sensitivity and reviving our... Uh, the revelation of God, of the fact that God Almighty has chosen us. There is a point that I want you to see. Uh, and, I, and I believe since last night, that, and, and what we talked about last night, this will really sink deep into your spirit. No man asked God to make that covenant. No man asked Jesus to go to the cross. No human being did that. God asked him to go to the cross. Man never heard of it. It was a mystery hidden in God, isn't that right? God asked Jesus to go to the cross in behalf of his covenant that he had with man. Now you let the, the awesomeness and the enormity of that soak down into your thinking. God did that because he chose you. 
And He chose you before you knew Him. He chose you before you were the righteousness of God. He chose you before you ever accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. That proves that it was His will for you to be born again. It's His will for you to be well. It's His will for you to be prospered. It's His will for you to be a conqueror in all areas of your life by that shed blood. Now, there's so much of the time, I know this is true in my life, and I know good and well it's true in your life too, that I would hear people say, and I would read scriptures that said, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Well, why? I mean, and I've heard people plead the blood, and I knew the devil was just absolutely horrified at the sound of it. But why? It's because that blood was shed in behalf of covenant. Brother, I mean, that gets serious with God. It's serious with everybody that knows anything about it. Amen. All right, let's go now to the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. And let's bear in mind what we've learned about covenant love as we read from the... Uh, let's, let's start reading the third chapter. I want to read down through that again and come into the fourth because it's all one thing. In verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice this statement. In fact, I'll point out to you certain statements I want you to watch because they're covenant statements. They're, they're, they're things that refer to the, to the covenant. How many of you were here last night? As we okay, great. All right. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now, that's a covenant statement. Remember we talked about the name change? The names being joined? Okay. Let's, let's talk about this just for a second, then we'll go on. Because I want there are certain foundation realities to this that I want you to get as we go. God said to Moses, I have been revealed to Abraham as El Shaddai, meaning total provider. Well, how was he revealed? How was he revealed to him that way? Well, first of all, he was, first of all, he was revealed to him that way. In covenant, he made covenant with him and said, I shall provide it. And he said, I am, when he came to him in the 17th chapter of Genesis, he said, I am El Shaddai. El meaning supreme to all beings. I'm the biggest thing you will ever know. And Shaddai meaning, the literal meaning of it, the nurse, the mother, the, the breasty one. He literally said to Abraham, and he's literally saying to his covenant family, I am your life. Come nurse the life out of me. Now, a mother's desire. Remember, the covenant is not the point. The point is the relationship the covenant provides called Hasid in Hebrew, agape in Greek, loving kindness, uh, covenant love in English. So we're, we're just going to absorb, absorb Hasid, agape, into the English language so when we say it, we have a revelation. We know what we're talking about, okay? Hasid has a parent's love in it. The desire, a mother's desire, to feed a child, to nurse it, to take care of it, to protect it. That is in Hasid, agape. It's fierce like a parent's love. It, it, and it says, if you harm my child, I'll kill you if I can. I mean, that's violent. But that's a parent's love. 
I mean, it's just, it is just ferocious. That element is in Hasid. And the uh, fact that God said, I am El Shaddai. And then he said something that it just <laughs> staggers my imagination every time I read it. And, I'll, and I'll say again, this is in the 17th chapter of Genesis. He came to Abraham and he said, I am El Shaddai. I am your provider. I am everything that you'll ever need. And he said, as for me. Now that phrase is so staggering. Here is the God of the universe coming to a man, and with one little phrase, he puts the man's choice and the man's decision equal to his own. And he says, as for me, my covenant is with thee and all of thy children after thee, and I will bless you and I will multiply you. In other words, I will empower you to prosper and I will empower you to multiply and I'll take care of you all the days of your life. Your enemies are my enemies. And so Abraham said, well, as for me, okay. <laughs> See, he said, my covenant is with you. He didn't say, now you come make covenant with me. No, no, no. He said, my covenant is with you. I've already made covenant. I've got my decision made. The only reason I'm going through all this is so you can understand how serious I am about it. Now, remember I started this out by saying, he said to Moses, Moses came along 400 years later, God said to Moses, I was revealed to Abraham as El Shaddai, the provider. But I'm about to be revealed as Jehovah. You're going to see my other name. He had never exercised his power in the earth up to that time. This is the reason Abraham's believing that God would raise Isaac from the dead. This is one reason there was so much faith in that, because there was no record that he'd ever done that, so how could he know he could do it? He accepted him at his name. He said he would not have made covenant to do it if he couldn't do it. So he accepted it by faith. And Abraham is the father of that kind of faith, and you and I are the children of that kind of faith. Yes. That's the kind of faith we have in us, and it's a shame if we don't use it. So, he said, I am about to be re revealed as Jehovah. And then he put names after that. I am Jehovah that sanctifies. I am Jehovah that heals. I am Jehovah that makes righteous. I am Jehovah the provider, the one who makes provision that is seen by other people. I am Jehovah that will never leave you nor forsake you even to the end of the world. I am Jehovah, your banner over you. In other words, the one that keeps us from being confused and keeps us in a straight line. I am Jehovah, your security protector. Now, why would he declare all that? Why would he say that I am all of these things and name himself? I am Jehovah, almighty God, I am the power of this universe. In other words, he's saying, we're going to find out what I'm made out of here in a little while. I'm going to jerk the slack out of that Pharaoh. I am Jehovah. Amen. Oh, now, wait a minute. That, that doesn't mean so much to our Gentilized minds, but think what that would mean to a people that were a covenant-aware people like Abraham and like Moses learned to be after God got hold of him. 
uncivilized him and took him up on top of that mountain and got the Egyptian out of him, which was the, the <laughs> current home of etiquette of those days, and let him be covenant-minded and taught him what kind of covenant he had with God. What would that mean? First thing that jumps into my mind is that name-changing ceremony. My name was sin. My name was sickness. If you call sickness, I said, here. <laughs> if you called poor boy, here. If you called inadequate, here. I can't make it, man. I don't know how hard I try. I come up short. For all have fallen short of the glory of God because all have sinned. Well, here's God said, I'm not short. I haven't sinned. I haven't failed. I haven't missed it. I am El Shaddai. I am Jehovah the healer. You need the healer. I'll take the sin. Amen. There was a name change. And Jesus came in the name of Jehovah. And moments before he went to the cross, he prayed in the 70 chapter of John. He said, I have declared your name. That's covenant talk, brother. He said, I pray. Last verse of the 17th chapter of John, Jesus said, I pray. Pray that the Hasid, Agape, with which you Agape Haseded me. Now that don't mean I just love you. That means that I am driven to take care of you. I am in covenant with you. This man Jesus did not function in the earth as the Son of God. He functioned in the earth as the son of Abraham, God's covenant brother. Amen. Amen. Now get hold of that. He said, I'm the son of man. Emptied himself of his divine privileges and depended on his Hasid covenant relationship with God. And we have record of when he was circumcised into the covenant. Amen? Amen. But now listen to this. He said, the, the agape hasid with which you have loved or taken care of me, I pray that that hasid that's in you be in them. Now you not only have the covenant, you have had implanted in your spirit this same giving drive overwhelming power source that the Word says will never fail. Agape, the seed, has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Now, sometime or other during your life, that'll dawn on you. When it gets down into your guts what Hasid really is, what we're really talking about. We're talking about the thing that makes God God. God doesn't go around showing off His power. He, have a, he has a servant's heart. But you better watch out for His power if you get in the way of the one He's serving. I mean, brother, <laughs> he'd go through here like Sherman through Georgia. You go to hurting his kids. you will be easy on you as you can, but he's going to get you out of the way. If you go to hurting the body of Christ, he'll only put up with it so far. And you go to depending on your covenant relationship with him, and he won't put up with it at all. 
Now, we'll get over into that in a little bit, but first we, we need to go through here and, and look at these covenant statements and settle some of them. So Jesus said after he was raised from the dead, you go in my name. That's a covenant statement. You go in my name. The whole family of heaven and earth is named after the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. My, what a statement that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Well, now, the Apostle Paul is praying that God grant us something here, so we're going to agree with him in prayer this morning. We're going to get this settled before we go any further. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. To be strengthened with might. It's a very interesting word translated might. The word might in the English language itself is a very interesting word. If you look it up in the dictionary and find the different definitions, a very interesting word. We use it in English, in, in street language, we use it loosely. It, it doesn't mean to us when we hear it what it actually means. We do a lot of words that way. We, we don't do justice to it. The Greek word translated might means the power of to do anything, nothing impossible to might. Now he says that I am praying for your inner man to be strengthened with the power of the Holy Ghost so that you're not limited anymore. Now there was a reason for that. That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in agape. Being rooted and grounded in it. That drive, the overwhelming desire to serve and to give and to bless. To empower, to prosper. To give, to live, and live, to give. The desire to be a covenant brother, to be the answer for somebody all the time. The desire, desire to see somebody set free. And all of us have, that, that know Jesus have experienced it in fleeting moments, some of us more than others. But we're coming to a place in these last days where we're going to be sustained by this. It's going to come on us as a body to the point where we are living for one another so strong with such power that it absorbs all of our needs until it absorbs the needs of the body of Christ. And we go through this earth, I mean, and cut a swath down through the devil's operation a mile wide and a yard deep, sweep this thing into the kingdom of God and get on out of here. Praise God. We're coming to that, and this is the force that will do it. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what's the length and the breadth, the height and the depth, and know the agape of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So... We've been named after God. We're in, we've had the covenant name change when we came into the body of Christ. So he says, now I pray that your inner man be strengthened with the might of God. Well, we need to know what that might is. And I'm going to just share with you a moment what it is. You can do a study on it yourself. We've got some tapes on it back there if you want to study it out. In the first chapter of the book of Colossians, the Holy Ghost tells us, by the writings of Paul, what that might is. And he makes almost an identical statement that he made here to the church at Colossae. And he said that you be strengthened with might. Well, let's turn over there and read it. You may want to make some notes in your Bible there next to it or something. In Colossians 1... Verse 9, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, 
strengthened with all might according to his glorious power with all patience and long suffering with joyfulness so the spiritual force of joy is the strengthening might the joy of the Lord is our strength. This is the spiritual force that is already invested in your spirit by the Holy Spirit when you got born again. The joy of the Lord, really joy, has been so long equated with happiness and comfort that we didn't know what joy really is. It's almost a shame <laughs> that it's called joy because we have so terribly misunderstood the word joy. Joy is not based on comfort. It's not based on happiness. It has nothing in the world to do with it except that it'll produce it. You hang on to your joy and you'll get happy right in the middle of the worst situation you've ever been in. But if you're waiting on happiness to get joy, you will never get it. Joy is a spiritual force, and it is the might of God. Now, Jerry was talking about there a moment ago. That's what gives God the ability to laugh at the devil, laugh at calamity. Oh, yeah, but he's God. He hasn't been through what I've been through. That's what you think. He's been through a lot more than you've been through. He lost his man, the man's wife a third of the angels, the highest anointed archangel he had, the human race, the earth, and all its fixtures. That's a lot of real estate, brother. Now, don't tell me he hadn't been through anything. The only reason you never considered God a failure is because he never did say he was a failure. He never received it. He never accepted it. He set out to fix it. Stayed joyful all the way through it. Never could upset him. Never could back him down. He just said, in a little while, partner, <laughs> this thing going to be mine. You catching on? Amen. Oh, this stuff is exciting. Now. Just take the Word of God there for a moment and just kind of close it on your thumb or something. And say this out loud. Father, Father I, believe I, I believe that I receive the spiritual force of joy. Force of joy. I, believe I, I believe I receive the Spirit of God, Spirit of God. Stirring, my stirring my inner man. Strengthening my inner man. With might, with, might, with, joy, with joy, so that I can comprehend, so that I can comprehend the, agape the agape Hasid of Jesus, which has been shed abroad in my heart, in my heart by, the by the Holy Ghost. I receive it now. I, receive it now. I officially release my faith for it. In Jesus' name, I am strengthened. Amen. Now, now when you read down through that, you say, yes, I can comprehend. I can comprehend the length, the breadth, the height, and the depth of the agape of God. Now, why would it have to be joy? Why didn't he say he'd strengthen our hearts with faith? Well, the Bible says, faith worketh by agape. So you need some understanding of agape to get faith to work. Amen. And why would it take joy then to understand agape? If, if you're not joyful, you can't understand God. He's joyful about everything. He never gets discouraged. He never gets despondent. He's always optimistic. 
Well, I don't believe in that positive talking stuff. Well, you're never going to get along with God. He's the most positive fellow you ever heard of in all your life. He's just not negative bone in him. Just, he just, there's no negativism in him now. And for you to understand anything about the way he does faith, you're going to have to understand something about joy, and because joy is what works so closely hand in glove to Hasid Agape. He's a joy to serve. He's filled with joy to get to serve you. We've all gone to church and wanted to be sorrowful and weary. Oh, oh, woe is us, dear God. Oh. Didn't feel like we'd been to church unless we just felt terrible. Oh, no. Just cry and squall and bawl. Oh, dear God, if you couldn't work up a good cry, you didn't feel like God blessed you. Oh, look at that munch over there jumping up and down and shouting and carrying on. That's a sacrilege to God. Well, it may be sacrilegious, but it didn't sack joy. <laughs> Whatever that means. But if you see God, you don't see an old man with a long beard that just kind of sits around thinking, Praise God, that's my kids. No, that's not God. Listen. You get God on you, you can outrun anybody on earth. Amen. You get God on you, you're the strongest thing on earth. He's the youngest of all the young. He's the powerful of all the powerful. He's filled with joy, might, strength, long-suffering, temperance. He's filled with faith. He's filled with agape. The desire to serve and get in the middle of it all. I'll show you what God's like. God comes to Abraham, I mean, comes to Adam, and he says, I want you to name all the animals, and if you'll stand right there, I'll go get them for you. <laughs> That's the way he is. You name them. I don't want to name them, you name them. I'll walk with you in the cooler then and give you some good ideas on what to call them. <laughs> and I'll go get him. Why? Why were there animals to start with? Scripture tells you. Why did he go get them? Why did he do all this? He's trying to find something that Adam likes. Trying to find a helpmate for him. Trying to find something he likes. And he kind of turned his nose up at all of them. I don't blame him. <laughs> and God knew he would. He just gave him an excuse to create them all. He's just serving Adam. The word Adam. Adam, the word Adam, means my blood. And God says, I made you a garden. When you get through with this, i got a whole universe out there waiting. Now, man, we're going to make garden after garden after garden after garden. We're going to go wild, me and you. And then Judah, I must I just want to show you what I can do, my man. <laughs> oh, Lord, I God. He said, let me show you, let me show you what this looks like. Sow wee, look at that. What you gonna call that? He said, it looked like a giraffe to me. <laughs> Got through with all of that and it wasn't enough. So he said, lay down here, boy, and go to sleep. And he brought forth the most beautiful thing he had ever created. And woke him up and said, how about this? <laughs> and Adam said, mm-hmm, I'll take that. That's the one I want right there. All this time, 
I said all that because that's all part of the revelation of what Hasid is. Hasid, agape, loving kindness, the desire to serve, to give. God didn't come in there to Adam and say, I'm going to be a God over you. That's the way the devil came on him. No, God is a servant. And the Hasid, agape, is that overwhelming desire to serve. That's what that is. That's what we're talking about. Amen. It always kind of amuses me and people are always talking to me about the sacrifices that I've been through for this ministry. <laughs> I never had so much fun in my life. <laughs> Man, no, I had, I've been through a lot. If you look at it from that side, people get to talk about what I've been through. I get thinking, you know, I've been through a bunch. But Jesus said no, and Hosea said it. They both, Hosea 6.6 6 said, God requires and desires Hasid, not sacrifice. When the, when the Hasid of God, the desire to serve, the desire to give, gets so strong in you, the giving is no longer a sacrifice. You're not giving it away. It's going to come back a hundredfold. Then it flows back at you. You hear your revelations coming back at you. You hear people coming at you and saying, Man, I want to tell you something. Boy, they just start preaching at you. And you're sitting there listening to them. He's like, Dear God, that's what I preached last month, wasn't it? <laughs> well, that thrills you. When you get a letter like Gloria shared, you get a letter from the penitentiary and some guy's turned on in his life is saved at 70 years old, man. That turns you on. Sacrifice? Are you? There's no sacrifice. That's Hasid. Well, let's give folks till it hurts. A seed don't hurt. All you said when you did that is you gave down to the place where you got selfish. And it started hurting. That's really true. And you probably should have. You found out where your hurt level was. Now go on past it and absorb it with the seed of God and give it all. Give all you got. Well, Brother Copeland, I didn't think the Lord required me to give all I have. Well, if you start with yourself, it's not such a big deal. <laughs> the part you try to save is the part you're going to lose. Amen? Well, <laughs> are you still in the book of Ephesians? <laughs> Let's go back over there. We prayed and received the joy of the Lord to know the love of Christ so that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Lord, you want me to do it. Man, they don't tell where this is going to go. Hold your hand there and turn back one page. Verse 19 of the first chapter. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? When he wrought in, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth. that you might be filled with the fullness of God, the fullness of him that filleth, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, the fullness of him that filleth.
we think about being filled with the fullness of God, having the Spirit of God rise up on the inside of us as an individual with such power and such strength that, like God, we overcome every obstacle in our path. And that is basically true. But it's never going to happen to you as an individual alone because it's the body that fulfills and filleth all of God. You're going to have to get full of the body of Christ for you ever to come to a place where you overcome the obstacles in your path like God, like Jesus walking the earth. We are in one another. Jesus spoke the words of God, therefore God gave him his spirit without measure. You have the Holy Ghost. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. But even Jesus himself said, The works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do. So obviously he didn't completely, totally manifest the fullness of God while he was in the earth. He said he didn't. He said there were some greater things yet to be done. How could he say that? Because he wasn't fulfilled. It took you to fulfill him. He considers himself partially empty without you in him. It takes the body to fulfill him. Now, as you come on into this fourth chapter, this is what he's talking about. The fullness of God. You take the entire body of Christ, both in heaven and in earth, working in one line together with God, with Jesus as the head, and the body fitly formed together, compacted by that which the body supplies, all working together, he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh within us. The strengthening power, the power of might, the power of joy, the power of Hasid, the power of agape, working through the body, he'll be able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what any individual can think. But we're no longer individuals. We are collectively the mind of Christ. We are in one another. Jesus is in you, he's in me. Well, I'm in you if he's in you, because I'm in him. We are covenanted together, and the Hasid of God, that makes God God, the seed of God that did all this has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Now follow that as we read here because I'm telling you, there's a revelation here that's going to cause death to bow its knee. It's going to cause the, it's going to cause the devil to be driven into a hole forever. Shines and wonders like we have never experienced before. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. What are you called to do? You're called to fulfill God by being a member of the body of Christ, not a member of just yourself, but a member of the body of Christ so that with all the saints we can comprehend God. Can't comprehend God without the seed flowing. It's when you begin to give, you begin to understand God. Not just getting. You don't understand God when you're getting. All you understand is you that God. But it's when you begin to give, you start understanding God. That's the reason it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. You start understanding God. Giving puts receiving into motion. Receiving don't put giving into motion. Giving puts receiving into motion. And then that puts giving into motion because it gives you more to give with. That's when you start understanding God. And the more you understand God, the more you realize how much fun it is to be like Him. And the more you become aware of Him, and He's in you, He dwells in you, there abideth faith, hope, 
and agape, but agape hasid is the greatest of these. It is alive. It's living in you. It abides in you. And the more you become aware of it, the more you act like it. You get to where you want to act like it. You want to be like it. People say, they think they're gods. I don't really care whether I am or whether I'm not. I'm going to act like one anyway. I'm going to be a god over the devil and every demon that comes down the road. And I have the name of my God, I have the cloak of my God, I have the weapon belt of my God, I have the blood of my God, I have the spirit of my God. So as far as I'm concerned, it will make no difference whether I'm a God or not. I got all that He is, all that He has, all that He ever will be, so <laughs> big deal. I am an agent of God going forth doing the works of God releasing his Hasid and getting in every kind of giving posture that I can get in to help you get your needs met. You have become the fulfillment of my heart because without you I don't have any way for Hasid to be released in me. And it's become the most important thing in my life. My own children and grandchildren are not enough. It's too much now. And they don't, sometimes they don't receive it like they should. They try, but it's easier for them to receive it from someone else, the same it's easier for some of your kids to receive it from me. So one way or the other, we're going to get them all blessed. Amen. That's the name of the game. Hasid. Hasid is the force. Hasid is the reason. So then he says, and the scripture that we've already read, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints to get them ready for this ministry, to minister a seed to one another, and to get them all together and share it with them and become partners with them and, and minister to them, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Just got through reading that in the third chapter coming to the knowledge of the agape of Christ. Well, God is love. Here he says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and in the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect or a mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, all of the body, ministering to the body, edifying itself in love, glorifying the head of the body, who is easily touched with the feelings of the infirmities of this body, ministering to one another, holding up one another, ministering to Jesus, holding up Jesus, holding up his name by which we've been named, until we become one and we've drawn together in the unity of my faith our faith. Not, we, we have personal faith that's strong enough to get our own personal needs. Everybody's got that. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about developing our faith to get one another's needs met. It takes more faith to get money enough for this convention than it does just for me to get money enough to get here. So what do I do? I believe God for the whole thing, but then each one of you took your part. See? You became a part of a whole. If you put $10 in there, 10000 or whatever, I mean, you, you put that money in there, that is your seed working. But there is a higher revelation of that when you realize that you are part of the fullness. You are part of the body. You are part of the whole thing. And that seed that's being planted into this ministry is not a... Ten dollar seed. It got absorbed into one big crop of seed that's millions of dollars big because of all the saints of God that have gotten involved in this thing and it's televising and it's reaching and it's doing the work. Well, if you only knew it and could raise your faith to the same level, you could be operating in faith on the same level I am because your seed became part of that seed and you could be getting results and return from God on that whole big seed. It's one body functioning in one direction. 
That's the reason Jesus said the little woman that gave the two mites had the biggest offering of anybody in there. So did she, as far as God was concerned, did her covenant relationship with him produce a hundredfold return on two mites? No. On the whole offering. Because she had the biggest offering in there. That lets you know what he had in mind. <laughs> this is the biggest return in the whole crowd, buddy. Well, we'll close this this afternoon, or this morning with this. Speaking the truth, verse 15, in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Now, I'm going to read the 15th verse backwards up through the 14th verse. Christ, which is the head, as we grow up into him by speaking the truth in love, will cause us no longer to be deceived by men of craftiness that are waiting to deceive us because we've let the winds of our doctrines blow us apart and carry us about because we've been children tossed to and fro. See? Now, when we quit being children is when we stop allowing the winds of our doctrines to blow us apart. Well, I can't go over there. Our doctrinal differences are just too great. Food. That's where you ought to go. Quit being a child. Well, after all, they don't even believe in Jesus. Well, go win them. You're not going to win anybody staying away from them. We run and hid from the Muslims. We run and hidden from... From all the other, the, you know, the higher of this and that and some everything else. I mean, we run and hide from them, brother. Well, after all, they don't believe the way we believe. They never will. You running from them. That's childish. Oh, I don't want my people going over there. That stuff's liable to get on them and taint the saints. A couple of saints are done tainted. <laughs> but a, a man instead of a child doesn't think like that. Not going to get tainted. They know in whom they have believed. A lot of children. God has been uh, revealing and restoring covenant truth to the body of Christ for years now. I've been studying it for 20 years. It's been... Uh, an, an entire move of God like to got destroyed because a bunch of children grabbed a hold of it, misused it, and took the covenant as what made it work. It's not the covenant that makes it work. It's just as true before God cut the covenant. The covenant just made Abraham realize that it would work. But they made the covenant the end and they started having church covenants. And they started cutting covenants between men in the congregation. And I know one fellow in my ministry, bless his heart, he got with another guy and they, they made some kind of covenant. I don't know whether they shed blood or not, but they got into some kind of agreement, put their bank accounts together and destroyed both those families. We've already got a covenant, dear heart. The, the, the Abrahamic covenant was entered into after Moses reestablished it. It was entered into by the cutting of the man's flesh when he was eight days old. Okay? The Christian covenant is entered into by the circumcision of the heart. And the word of the Abrahamic covenant is the cutting instrument. And as you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that instrument cut down into your heart, your spirit was circumcised and reborn. And you entered into a covenant between Jesus and God Almighty. The resurrected man, Jesus, is entered into covenant with God on Jesus' own blood. 
and you entered into His covenant with God and became a joint heir with Jesus. Well, if you're joint heir with Him, you're joint heir with me. And I'm joint heir with you. I mean, look at it, sweetheart. This is what you get. <laughs> You're going <laughs> to... I'm doing my best and I'm working, but I'm telling you what, up to now, this is all you get. <laughs> forever. We're stuck with one another forever. But I don't consider it being stuck with you. I consider it being stuck to you. Praise <laughs> God. And I'm hanging on to you with everything I have. You're part of my grace. There is part of God's grace in you that I can't get anywhere else. I go to God to get it. He says it's sufficient, but it's going to come through her. It's going to come through Him. God's grace is abounding toward us, but it's coming out of us. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, did you get anything out of this today? Amen. Amen. Aren't you thankful for God's grace that abounds toward us? His grace is sufficient. I'd like to pray with you right now. God is such a good God. He wants to meet you right where you are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every single person watching this broadcast that's putting their faith and their trust in your person, your son, and your word. I thank you that your grace is sufficient, that your goodness is, is just beyond our, our understanding. And, Lord, we receive that goodness into our life by turning our complete lives over to Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the authority that we have in Jesus' name. And we just take authority over every attack of the enemy and loose the Holy Spirit to minister to God's people in the name of Jesus. We thank you for total victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm so thankful that I'm a covenant partner with God, aren't you? And all we have to do is simply receive the finished work of the cross in our lives. Hope that blesses you as much as it does me. If you'd like to know more about your covenant relationship with the Lord, why not request this tape series by Kenneth Copeland? It's called The Blood Covenant, and it includes six teaching tapes and a convenient study guide. We'll send it to you for only $20. That's one-third off the regular price. Just ask for television offer number 460 and write Kenneth Copeland, Fort Worth, Texas, 76192. That's $20 for television offer number 460. And our address again is Kenneth Copeland, Fort Worth, Texas, 76192. The Blood Covenant, guaranteed to be a real blessing to you. Next week, we're going to be in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at our Philadelphia Victory Campaign. That's December the 4th, 5th, and 6th at the Philadelphia Civic Center. If you live in the, the East Coast area, particularly the Northeast around Philadelphia and New York, we'd love to see you there at the Civic Center in Philadelphia next week, December the 4th, 5th, and 6th. Be sure to send us your prayer requests so that we can add our faith to yours. Write Kenneth Copeland, Fort Worth, Texas, 76192. You This program has been sponsored by Kenneth Copeland Ministries and our partners in this area.